Well, good evening, everybody. 16 years so glad that you're all here. We won't count how many here are here on Zoom just now, but pretty good room full. Got a few here in the room. And we are ready to start our 10-week series on the exile. The exile. <laughs> um, okay. Why don't we open with a word of prayer, and then we can go from there. The Lord be with you. Also, also with, you. with you. Gracious God, we thank you so thank much you. for the gift of scripture. We thank you for all the blessings that you've surrounded us with. We thank you for this sacred time and space to be together, that we can gather around your word, that we can read about uh, the events of the past and think about what they mean for us today. Oh God, as we dive deeply into the exile, we ask that we might uh, empathize with those uh, about whom we read. May we see ourselves in this story, oh God. May we also hear the promise that you are with us no matter what. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, yeah, this is a 10-week study. This is going to run every week from now until November 16th. We'll be totally different people by then, but... Um, We'll be finishing up with the exile the week before Thanksgiving, and then during Advent, we'll be doing meals and worship together during this time frame. So Wednesday nights, we'll continue to be together, but um, we'll be together in a different way come Advent. So definitely looking forward to that, but also looking forward to these next 10 weeks as we kind of dive into um, something I, I wrestled with about um, where exactly to focus and what to do. Um, those of you who are um, studious biblical scholars will know that the exile is a great big thing. It is a foundational series of events that took place um, about 600 uh, to 550 years before Jesus was born. Um, but they made such an, an amazing impact and imprint on God's ancient people that its reverberations are felt still today. Um, I don't think it's overstating it to say that when we read about the exile, the events surrounding the exile and, and that reality for God's ancient people. So I was saying that when we went through the revelation last year, you heard me talk about how, um, like answering the question, is the revelation unfolding before our eyes today? Well, the answer is yes, as long as we keep in mind that God always provides promises when the world as we know it is ending. And when we study the exile together, we really are looking at a series of events which added up to the world as uh, God's ancient people knew it came to an end. And so today we're going to kind of introduce what the exile uh, is and was. Um, we'll talk about some of the texts that will be involved in our study. It is a broad range of, of different texts. Um, believe it or not, the exile is um, reflected upon deeply in the Psalms, although we usually think about Psalms much early, being written much earlier by King David and uh, court musicians and things like that. Uh, but it is reflected deeply upon in the Psalms. It certainly is um, explained and discussed in the histories, including the Kings and the Chronicles. Uh, it is um it is dived deep into in some of the hero epics of the Old Testament, like Daniel. Um, it is <laughs> looked at in an extraordinarily profound way in the prophets, especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but also some of the minor prophets. Um, and it is found in uh, the earliest known writings of apocalypse that, that we know of, again, including Daniel and in other places. Um, so we get this such a broad range uh, of different perspectives and different ways of writing about what was happening on the ground uh, and also remembrances of what had happened uh, in the exile that I think it's going to, uh, it, the exile is almost going to be like a diamond that we hold up to the light and look at through all these uh, different facets and, and uh, that we'll be able to see it from all these different angles. Um, but let me say again, you really can't overstate the importance of the exile because this was the end of the world as the people knew it. Um, you may have heard me mention before that there are these huge foundational events that take place uh, early on in, in God's story with God's people. Um, the first one is the Exodus. 
and the themes of the Exodus reverberate all through both the Old and the New Testament. In fact, the end of the exile was written about and, and remembered as this, the, the second Exodus. Um, but right on top of that, I would say in importance and its um, influence over God's people throughout the ages is, is the event of the exile, the events of the exile, but also the, the mindset of the exile, the things that were learned during the exile, um, all the texts that were brought together and compiled during the exile. It, it's thought that it was during the exile in Babylon that the first real idea of a Hebrew Bible or what we would call the Old Testament started to come together as they brought together their origin stories and their histories and their songs um, to try to remember who they were. Because in a really important way, the exile challenged God's people to remember who they were, to rem remember who God was, uh, is, and uh, to remember what really matters. And so those are going to be some of the themes that we talk about as we take a look at the exile. We are going to open our Bibles today. We are going to, um, hopefully through these 10 weeks, we'll be doing mostly reading of scripture uh, and interpreting both uh, through different lenses, but also through other scripture. Um, but today, as kind of an introduction, we'll take a look at a couple other things first. As I said, the, um, the exile, which is sometimes called the Babylonian captivity. I want you to remember that phrase, the Babylonian captivity. It's awful wide, I'm sorry. Um, okay. The cultural imprint of the exile or the Babylonian captivity, um, it shaped the lives and the outlook and the faith of uh, God's people uh, from the time that it began happening all the way uh, up till today. And so um, there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence all around us, if we know where to look, that this still makes an impression upon us today. Um, the after effects of the exile <clears throat> were still the context in which uh, Jesus of Nazareth was born. Um, what had happened in the exile and the aftermath of the exile, the kind of ruin that it brought to God's people, uh, the rebuilding that they had had to do, uh, the knife's edge that they stood on once they began to be ruled over by foreign uh, empires, which all began with the exile, which we can clearly uh, still see happening uh, with the Roman Empire in the New Testament. Um, it, it, was, uh, it became the context into which Jesus was born. And so that's really important because it continued to be the context in which people who followed Jesus lived. Then it's the language that they used to talk about uh, the fact that they weren't, at least in this, this earthly realm, free people. Um, that all started about 600 years before Jesus was born and was still the way that they were interpreting their lives uh, all that time later into Jesus's generation and for many generations after as the texts of the New Testament were written. So much so that when you do take a look at something like the Revelation written uh, over a hundred years after Jesus was born, the way that it talks about um, life under the control of the empire, uh, the, the word that they use for the evil empire is Babylon. It becomes a character in the revelation as it continues to ravage the people and, and brutalize them. Um, of course, there's some coded language there. I don't think that maybe uh, John was entirely free to write about Rome. And so he used this word that his people would know the impact and the meaning of, which was Babylon. This is the massive overshadowing foreign empire that comes in and, and destroys uh, and pillages and takes what it wants. And the, the word for that is, is Babylon, even up to the end of the New Testament. So our scriptures, both Old and New Testament, are filled with this idea of the imprint of the exile, something that would never leave uh, the consciousness of God's people. Uh, even 1400 some years later, 
<clears throat> um, just a, a real brief history here, but after 1517, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses onto the castle church door in Wittenberg, um, he began to write a lot against the Pope and against the, the church. It wasn't called the Catholic Church at the time, the Roman Church or the church, uh, kind of detailing his grievances with the church. There was one treatise that he wrote, which was printed in the year 1520. And uh, right after he wrote this and it was distributed, he received his letter of excommunication from the Pope. A year later in 1521, he went to the German city of Worms, Worms and he partook in the great debate at Worms or what we call the Diet of Worms. If this was confirmation class or Sunday school, we go, Diet of Worms, ew. <laughs> But the Diet of Worms was this big debate about what Luther was saying uh, and the archbishops and other people from the, from the Roman church. And um, you can see a, a painting, a remembrance of it there on the screen. Um, and there was a really famous thing that Luther said. He probably looked just like this too, I'm sure. But um, a really famous thing that he said when he was defending himself uh, against the papists. And I wonder if anybody can remember that really famous statement that he made at the Diet of Worms. Maybe you've gone on to oldlutheran.com and you've ordered a pair of socks that say, here I stand, here I stand, I can do no other. So that thing that he wrote in 1520, the thing which he was defending when he made that famous statement, the name of the treatise was the Babylonian captivity of the church. And in that, he argued that the Catholic Church was sort of holding the sacraments uh, hostage and not allowing people to freely access God through uh, Christ and the sacraments. And so that was the main focus of that treatise, but it, it sort of made the Protestant Reformation kind of blow up and, and be what it was. And, and uh, he became a much more famous figure uh, after some of those statements. So. Um, all the way through the 16th century and the Reformation, we can feel the reverberations of the Babylonian captivity and how important that was and what, what an important symbol Babylon was for the evil empire. Luther was wise enough to use that language. And at this point, that was 2100 year old language. Um, now it's 2600 year old language. But um, to identify the evil empire, knowing that people who read and studied the Bible would be familiar with what Babylon represented, which is, again, the powerful foreign evil empire, which took so much from God's people. And I would argue still today, I mean, you sort of have to, to look around, uh, but it doesn't take long. I just pulled this image off of Google today. Apparently, there's a movie called Babylon coming out this year uh, on Christmas Day. So if you're not celebrating the birth of Jesus, um, you can go see Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie in Babylon. It's still this, just that word still reverberates with us and, and the shadow that it's cast and the, the imprint that it's created still today that we understand how important this set of events was. And it's because all the way back in the time of the writing of the Old Testament, uh, the gathering of ancient manuscripts and the writing of new ones, uh, the people were experiencing the end of the world as they knew it. And they wrote about it passionately. And they wrote about it from many different perspectives. They wrote about it from within Babylon, like Ezekiel. They wrote about it from outside Babylon in Jerusalem, like uh, Jeremiah. They wrote about it as they made their way back from uh, the captivity or the exile back toward uh, Judah, like um, second and third Isaiah, Ezra and Nehemiah. There's just, there's just so much there. So we're going to try to capture that in 10 weeks and understand why was this uh, really so important. I'm going to pause for a second and take a drink of water. Are there questions or comments so far? One of the reasons that I think that <clears throat> this is an important topic to talk about right now, as we make our way from the beginning of, of the exile through the events that happened through the captivity itself and the end of the exile is because in so many ways it has felt, whether we've said it out loud or not, 
it has felt when we couldn't worship in our own worship space, when we couldn't see the people that we loved face to face, when we couldn't be together, when we were scared to breathe the same air, and in some ways we still are. This feels like in some ways the journey back toward some kind of normalcy. I think what we'll find toward the end of our study is that there was a lot of grief. There was a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation, a lot of unanswered questions like what's going to happen next? What's this new reality going to look like for the uh, for God's ancient people? It was, what do we do? Rebuild the same city again? Do we rebuild the temple again? Do we go back to the way things were? Or is there going to be something totally new and different? I think we're asking a lot of the same questions today. So I hope that you'll stay tuned all 10 weeks so we can kind of work through this together. I invite you to open your Bibles. I told you we'd open our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 23. And we're going to start at verse uh, 36. And in fact, we're not going to read this right now, but I want you to look at it. And I know that that might sound strange. So I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 23. And we're going to uh, start looking at verse 36. And what we're looking at is the text all the way to the end of the book. Second Kings chapter 23, verse 36. And it might seem odd that we're just, uh, even from afar, uh, I don't necessarily want you to start reading the lines yet. We will. And in fact, if we have time at the end today, we'll start reading through this. But I want us to notice uh, the difference between different kinds of writing in the Bible. If you've done studies with me before, you know that it's about the text, definitely, but I think that we can understand and absorb the text a lot better if we can understand uh, why it's there, what it looks like. Um, we're really going to focus on a different text today, but I want you to just look at it. If you have to turn the page to get to the end of the book of Second Kings, I invite you to do that and just see how much uh, text is there. So for the importance of the time frame that we're going to call the exile, this is really a short telling of what happened. Um, but we can see it spans uh, two chapters plus a little bit. Um, we can see that this is written in paragraph form. Uh, if you're just looking in a cursory way at the text, you'll notice that there aren't any quotes. Nobody uh, necessarily speaks here except for the historical narrator. And so I just want for a moment to, to look at this and uh, see what the book of the, what the books of the kings or second kings here is all about. This is history. It's telling us what happened. It's not offering uh, opinion. Um, so what this does in Second Kings, is it, it offers us the historical perspective of what happened. It really just says this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. There's, um, we, we need to know this. This is a really important part of the telling of the story. What we see here in, in the books of the kings, let's just say, or the historical books, this would be uh, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles is it really just what attempts to be a non-biased telling of the events. It's like if you're reading a nonfiction history biography or something, just kind of takes you through the events that happened. Um, and this is really important for us to know because uh, if we look at verse 36 of chapter 23, it says Jehoiakim, these names are all gonna be on the test by the way. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebedah, daughter of Padiah of Rumah. It does say he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, just as all his ancestors had done. That's a very interesting line, and we'll, we will get into that. Um, but notice how it's giving us dates, names, and events. 
Interesting uh, side note that when we hear about the kings of Judah, they are traced through their mother's lineage. And so we'll, we'll hear that a few times as those kings are, are introduced to us. Um, again, if we have time, we're going to uh, read through some of this tonight. Uh, maybe we will, maybe we won't. But I wanted us to, I wanted you to have this in front of you because the brief history that I'm gonna lay out uh, right now can be found here. And we'll read what the Bible has to say about it. But I want you to understand what we're talking about when we talk about the exile. So the history as you would read it in the encyclopedia or something would be like this. After the battle of Carchemish in the year 605 BC, that's 605 years before Christ, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, remember that name, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm surprised you don't hear more babies named Nebuchadnezzar these days. If we had a boy. Anyway, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was actually Nebuchadnezzar II, um, he besieged Jerusalem in that year. Um, maybe at some point I'll show you maps and things, but the Babylonian influence was spreading to the north. The kingdom of Egypt uh, lay to the south. And so when they met in battle, along with the Assyrians and the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians, which were a, a big deal before the Babylonians, and they also defeated the Egyptians. Um, the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar saw Jerusalem as an extremely important city based on where it was. You've heard me say before, the Holy Land as we know it today is an extremely important stretch of land between the entire African continent, at that time most importantly Egypt, and basically the rest of the world, which is all that they knew existed. And so Jerusalem was a very important city for Nebuchadnezzar to capture. In that same year, he besieged the city of Jerusalem, which resulted in King Jehoiakim, who we just heard about in 2 Kings, paying tribute uh, to Nebuchadnezzar and allowing his soldiers into the city, and it was basically controlled by them. In the fourth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Jehoiakim changed his mind. And he refused to pay tribute uh, anymore. He closed his gates to the Babylonian armies. That led to another siege of the city in the year 597. Jehoiakim, because of that siege, eventually died. And his successor named Jehoiachin, not Jehoiakim, but Jehoiachin, took his place. Uh, Jehoiakim ruled for a very short time. It was a very troubled reign surrounded by uh, the Babylonians who eventually broke down the walls and the uh, city of Jerusalem was destroyed in 587 BC. Um, we can say that in a historical context and just kind of move past it. We will dive deeper into how horribly devastating and traumatic it was for the city of Jerusalem to fall to this foreign army. And uh, starting around this time, the first deportation of Judeans or people living in Jerusalem and the surrounding area began as Nebuchadnezzar ordered people of increasingly low status to be shipped off to Babylon. That was the way that the Babylonians conquered. They would defeat a city, take away its inhabitants, sometimes move other people into that city uh, and take, starting with court officials and soldiers and craftspeople, and then kind of all the way down to, you know, tradespeople and whatnot, back to uh, their, their home city of Babylonia for the glory of their own empire. It was a brutal way to rule, but it was also pretty effective because it sort of made sure that people couldn't organize and revolt and left people extraordinarily weak. And so this is what started to happen uh, th throughout those years. So we're gonna remember Jehoiakim, we're gonna remember Jehoiachin, and we're also gonna remember Zedekiah because after uh, Jehoiachin's death, um, actually, let me take that back. Jehoiachin was taken to Babylon. And after he was taken to Babylon, uh, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar set up somebody named, Nebuch uh, named Zedekiah to be the king in Jerusalem. 
And so that was kind of devastating. I'm gonna switch slides here, if it'll let me. And we're gonna take a look at a graph like a picture. Nope, I'm gonna move this so people in the room can see it. This is um, a graphic of the genealogy of the kings of ancient Israel and Judah. Before we dive into that, we can say that after Solomon, the kingdom split between north and south. You probably knew that already, but it's going to be important to remember as Jeroboam ruled Israel in the north and Rehoboam ruled Judah in the south. From that time on, the two kingdoms would never really be united again. In fact, their separation would grow and grow until they kind of hated each other. So we're going to follow the genealogy on the right-hand side. It starts in this graphic technically with Saul. We're going to take a look at David because it really starts with David. And if you remember back in, starting in 2 Samuel, continuing into 1 Kings and, and, and in other places, especially in the Psalms, we hear over and over about this promise that God made to David, saying, someone from your line will always rule over in what in David's time was called Israel, that is this united kingdom, which was really important because since the Exodus, the people have been kind of floundering, there have been judges and kind of a, mes uh, uh, kind of a terrible king. Uh, and so they were really looking for a foothold to sort of enjoy sovereignty or ruling themselves, making their own decisions. God said to David, from now on, because of who you are and who your descendants will be, my promise to you, David, is that someone from your line will always sit on the throne over Israel. Now, when the kingdom split, it was interpreted, since David was from uh, Bethlehem in the south, since he ruled in Jerusalem, which was in the south, that what God really meant was someone in your line will always reign over the over Judah, the southern kingdom, and that will never come to an end. We hear about it over and over and over. And it became such that the king ruling from Jerusalem, the one in David's line, was a symbol of God's promise to the people. As long as there's a king on the throne in David's line, you are sovereign and I am with you and my promise is being fulfilled. Now we can trace it all the way through. All these names are going to be on the test. So write them down if you have to. <laughs> we can trace all the way down and we recognize some of these names probably. Ahaz, Ammon, Josiah was a great king kind of got the people back in line. A lot of these kings had uh, terrible rules and did terrible things. But notice after Josiah, <clears throat> what happens? First, there's Jehoahaz, kind of lost to history mostly. But then also his son Jehoiakim. And that's who we read about in 2 Kings uh, chapter 23, verse 36. Jehoiakim ruling in Jerusalem. Notice what happens right here. We have Jehoiakim, we have Jehoiachin, who we've been introduced to, and then in kind of a thus and sundry way, we have Zedekiah, who wasn't really a son of Josiah. He was more like sort of a third cousin kind of a thing, but he technically has the blood uh, of David probably, so he rules as king. We're going we're gonna to read more and more and figure out this was an extraordinarily chaotic time. And so you have to do things on this type of graphic, like make dotted lines, because Zedekiah. But then what happens after Zedekiah? Who can tell me? Does it just keep going around? No, it ends. It ends. You won't get any further than Zedekiah if Zedekiah were <clears throat> was um, a rightful ruler at all. He was the last one. And as we read through the, the psalm, as we read through the prophecy, when we hear about um, all of the devastation, a huge part of it is that along with the Babylonian exile came the end of the line of David. 
Again, we can see reverberations in this in the New Testament. There's a reason that Matthew's gospel is the first one in our New Testament. It's not because it was the first written. Does anybody remember what's at the very beginning of Matthew? Don't look anybody in the eye. Oh, Jesus. Genealogy. A genealogy. And who does it link Jesus to? David. 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 All the way back to Abraham, actually. Yeah, but well. right in the middle there, and, and, and the point definitely of the genealogy is not to prove that he's a Jew connected to Abraham. It is to prove that he, through his mother's lineage, is connected to David. That he is now the rightful ruler in Jerusalem. Very bold, dangerous, and important for us to start the New Testament with, by the way, this guy that we're talking about in the subsequent stories is the next in the line of David. Because when we talk about the devastation, the end of the world as the people knew it, a huge part of that is the end of the line of David, which for the people, as terrible as some of the kings were, remained a cornerstone of God's promise to the people that God would always be with them. The symbol that was always there right in front of them was the king sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. As long as that was there, we know that God's promise is good. Yeah, the economy is bad. Yeah, there's a drought. Yeah, uh, there's wars at the periphery and we're scared. But that king is there. God's promise is strong. God hasn't failed us yet. But this is the end of that. And so part of the world as they knew it ending includes an end of the line of David in Jerusalem. So you might see this list of names. And then when we read through the kings and as we go through the prophets and kind of stumble over some names, we might think of that as just like a hindrance to understanding. But what it really is, is a reminder for us about how important it is for the ancient people to hold on to that promise and how that was shattered when Jehoiachin was taken into captivity in Babylon and then Zedekiah died. That's the end. That's it. The end of Second King. It's also worth noting, by the way, that when you flipped to the last uh, page of Second Kings, that's where that history ends, right? Isn't it meaningful to know that the blank space on that page means that the line of kings has ended? The books of the stories of the kings from David on through has now come to an end. I think that's important to point out because when we open our Bibles, we need to take full stock of what's in front of us. And the blank space at the end of Second Kings means that story is over. Now a new story is going to have to begin. Any thoughts, questions, comments about that? The other thing that's well worth mentioning, and then we'll read some scripture together, um, and we just sort of tiptoed past it earlier, uh, is the destruction of the temple. <clears throat> the destruction of Jerusalem as a city is devastating because it's the home of the people. It is certainly a symbol of God's providence and care for the people that they live there. Uh, just before the Babylonians became such uh, a clear and present danger, uh, there was the Assyrians, but when the Assyrians attacked Jerusalem, we can read about it again in the histories, or we could read the first part of Isaiah and hear about God defeating the Assyrians and pushing them away. They never, even though they were so powerful, they never did take Jerusalem. Now that story again gets flipped on its head because the Babylonians did. Um, but the centerpiece of Jerusalem is certainly the temple. And it can be hard for us to understand we sort of spirit dwellers who understand God as in all things, in all places, at all times. But for uh, the ancient people, especially people living 600 years before Jesus, and for uh, uh, 500 years before that, God lives in the temple, right? Only one person can even get into the space where God actually lives. And then the glory of God kind of radiates from the Holy of Holies, 
continually so that if you're on the temple steps or in the temple courtyard, or if you can see the temple, it's this shining beacon of the glory of God. Again, just like with the, the Davidic king, the temple is, stands as a symbol that has stood for 500 years uh, almost, and it is this bright and gleaming symbol of God's providence. There was even a special word that, that we're gonna talk about in a few moments for it called Zion. It's one of it's the one of the hills that the city of Jerusalem is built on, but that became like a code word. God has protected us here in the past. This is part. This is God's dwelling, and again, it's kind of that other cornerstone of the promise of God that God will always be with the people, defending the people, caring for the people, um, and just being present with them there in their spiritual home of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem is destroyed, it's devastating. When the temple is destroyed. It's the end of the world. It leaves so many questions and not very many answers. Questions like, how could this happen? Why would this happen? Where is God? And that question probably sticks to the heart uh, of the exiles, maybe more than anything else, because <clears throat> what they knew for forever because 500 years is a long time. What they knew forever is that God lives in the temple. And when the temple is destroyed, the obvious question that we're asked with is, where is God now? Where does God live if not the temple? As a glimpse into uh, some of the stuff we'll be talking about, <clears throat> is it any wonder that Ezekiel, who lived in Babylon, prophesied from Babylon, opens up his uh, prophetic career with a vision of a movable spirit of God with, with wheels all around and can move in any direction. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. You never heard about uh, cherubim and seraphim or what we can only describe as the glory of God with eyes all around moving in every direction. That was a brand new idea through a vision of one of God's prophets saying, God is movable. God can survive even if the temple is destroyed because God can move anywhere. The important point for Ezekiel to his people in exile, hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem was God can even make it here. God can come here because before that, they weren't convinced. If the temple is destroyed, then God is dead. There's really no other way to get at the heart of the problem or the question. How did they communicate that God was not dead? Mm. Yeah, the question is, how did they communicate that God is not dead? I think the way that we'll answer that is in kind of a prolonged way. As we take a look at the difference between history which kind of tells us what happened. It talks about the destruction of the temple. It's brutal, but it doesn't try to answer that question. People like Jeremiah, people like Ezekiel, they work really, really hard to answer that question. And they come at it from all different ways to say, listen, 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 no, no, no. We are hearing from God. We can see God in visions. And let me tell you, God is not dead. And one, again, for Ezekiel, it's, his, it's one of many, but his inaugural vision is of the movable glory of God. Yes, the Holy of Holies is no more, but the glory of God is not contained. I would argue that Ezekiel's vision is telling the people that the destruction of the temple freed God to travel about, even to Babylon, where they were living. And so it's going to take some time to answer that, I think. But what we the beauty of scripture is the different ways uh, that the people inspired by God to write these words, the way that they'll go about communicating that to the people. People who are left in ruin, people whose spiritual home has been destroyed, people who are asking questions like, where is God now? God spoke to these people, showed visions to these people, and they interpreted these things, spoke them to the people, 
always, even in the tough ones, always is a comfort to say, God is not gone, God is not dead. Jeremiah is going to come at it in sort of like through the back door saying, let's talk about the reasons that this happened. What have we done for God lately? Jeremiah or Ezekiel and Babylon will come about it a different way to say, listen, God is not contained in the temple. God can't be anymore. But look at this new thing that God is doing and showing to us. Okay. Other questions or comments? As we came here, the COVID was, was going to keep us away from each other. Thank you. Yes. Because where do we meet God? Yes. We have that concept of God. But where do we have to meet God and worship God and have our family together? Absolutely. Where does that happen? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a very good point. So for folks on uh, Zoom, the comment here was we we started to hear that a lot during COVID, especially in conversations in the church. Um, if we can't go, if we can't go to church, then we've always done that. If we can't go to church and worship, how are we going to worship? If we can't go to church and be in the sanctuary around the communion railing for communion, how can we have communion? How can we worship? And so a lot of the of the faithful writing and, and uh, people who have set up so many different ways to worship now have been doing some of that same kind of work. Um, broadcasting that God is not contained to our building. God is not contained to us sharing the same breath. God can be worshiped in all these different ways. And so a lot of, in a lot of ways, we've been trying to face the same challenges. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to invite you to flip in your Bible, unless you just want to look at the screen, to Psalm 137. Psalm 137. Now, of all the places that you might expect to hear about the exile, knowing that it took place 500 years after the death of David and uh, through the, the destruction of the temple, so many of the Psalms were written as worship songs for the temple. You might not expect to hear about the exile uh, in, in the Psalms, but let's read together Psalm 137. I think since we have so many folks that are in Zoom, just for the auditory part, I might go ahead and read it. But listen to Psalm 137. <clears throat> By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captives asked us for songs. And our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Now, some folks think that this next, the last three verses were added sometime later, but here it is on our page. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator. Happy are they who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against a rock. Oh. Okay, so in a place we might not expect, right here toward the end of the book of Psalms, we have this lament over the destruction of Jerusalem. It is uh, in the parlance of the Psalms, it is a communal lament. That is a, a sharing of, of sadness, grief, and loss amongst people. Um, probably worthwhile to point out, this is a little bit of an ironic Psalm because it says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Although this was clearly written to be a song. And so very well at some point may have been sung, not just by Bob Marley, does anybody know that? 
by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. No. It's Bob Marley. And there we went when we remembered Zion. Anybody? No. Anyway. Y yes, some of us remember that. Okay. If the oats didn't know it, I would have to go back and Google it to make sure it was real. <laughs> Ken was singing it. Oh, cool. Yeah, good. I used to sing it to my son when he was little. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. That's so nice. Uh, Ken, Ken said he used to sing it to his son. That's so nice. Uh, not the last part, probably, right? Not the last verse, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> now it, it takes it takes a brutal turn it really does and the last three verses um clearly there are hard feelings here and the the amazing thing is how well this reflects what happens in the prophets when we look at jeremiah when we look at uh, ezekiel for all the things that they're accomplishing they also include a whole lot of damnation for the enemies of uh, God's people, including Edom, including Babylon and others. Um, so there, there's room for that all over in the telling of the exile story, uh, a, a condemnation of those who participated in some way. If we want to look at the history of it, uh, those who succumbed to Babylon, who continued to pay their tribute, as some would say Jehoiakim should have continued to do, uh, joined in the army and contributed to the destruction of Jerusalem and the killing and deportation of God's people. Um, I, I have found, and I want to be careful about how I talk about this because it's not my area of expertise, but uh, I have found that uh, certain types of, of spirituality, especially uh, marginalized spirituality, uh, when you take a look at some of uh, the, the Christianity of slaves, for example, African slaves in America and elsewhere, um, this type of thing and this type of story resonates in a deep and profound way. Those who have been taken from their home and brought somewhere else, um, for whatever reason, resonate with this. Um, and so I think that's worth saying. I wonder if that's why Bob Marley and others have put music to some of the words like this that um, connect deeply with those who have been taken from their homes, as the ancient uh, Judeans were. So we can take a look uh, at the text here. I was hoping for a little more conversation. I wonder, uh, what about this text uh, stands out to you? What, what did you notice when we read it for the first time together? The fact that the tormentors that their cat that their captors wanted them to perform, to sing, to be joyful in their presence. Right. A absolutely. Um, and again, we can think about it in more recent contexts, but this idea that the captives must somehow perform for the captors, uh, it is striking. Um, in the room here, we also heard uh, the, the deep and profound sadness. Uh, is that what you said? Yeah, the deep and profound sadness that um, it's like, what, what do we do? What do we do here? The, the immediate posture of the psalmist is kind of slumped down on the ground, weeping um, and hanging up their... Uh, their musical instruments. These would have been instruments designed and built and played for temple worship. We're just gonna hang those up. What, what do we need to use those for anymore? Um, and they don't want to forget. Yes, that was the comment in the room. They don't want to forget. So at first we hear about the weeping when they remember, here's this word, Zion. We'll touch on that again in a minute. But then again, in, in um, four, uh, verse five, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither and let the tongue, my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. 
And if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, there is this aching to remember. Um, you can see this played out in a lot of different dramas and things. Um, yes. Oh, yeah, we just passed. Thank you. Yes. We just passed the anniversary of 9 11. And um, the whole thing is never forget. Never forget. All, uh, yeah, that's right. And I saw that the New York Giants, I'm not sure if we've got any fans here, but uh, on the back of their helmets were the Twin Towers, and it says, We remember. We remember. There, there is a desperation not to forget where you came from and what has happened. Um, it is worthwhile at this moment to recognize that the, the exile lasted over 50 years, some would say 70 years, kind of depending on when uh, those first people were taken away. Um, life expectancy in the ancient world wasn't what it is today. That is generations of people. Remember Moses had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years to be sure that he would die before they got into the promised land. This is 50, 70 years. This is generation after generation. This is like a plea to future generations. Don't forget. Don't forget where we came from and all that we had and God's promise to us. The promise piece is really wrapped up in a bow uh, with the remembrance of Zion in particular. I'd like to talk about that for a minute before we finish today. Um, Zion, the word Z-I-O-N, is first mentioned way back in 2 Samuel. Uh, it, it's, it's a historical book, so it just tells us the history that David attacked a Jebusite fortress up on top of a hill, and its, its name, its Jebusite name, was Zion. The city of David was built there. Eventually, during the reign of Solomon, the temple was built right next door. Traditionally on Mount Moriah, where Abraham uh, was ready to sacrifice Isaac. Um, but that word Zion became kind of a cultural remembrance of all that had happened there. It became a way to remember God's promise to David that he would take the throne, that he would rule successfully, that his kingdom would be united, and that the Davidic line would never end, that there would always be a king in David's line sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. It gets really popular in the Psalms because David writes songs and others write songs about, about Zion, which is really a kind of a code word for God's promise. God's promise to always be with the people and with the king there in Jerusalem. It's also extremely popular in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, which describes the, uh, the assault of the Assyrians and their inability to capture Jerusalem. Remember, we are Zion. You cannot defeat us here. Uh, God's promise is true. The king sits on the throne. We are a sovereign nation, and there's nothing you can do about it. We are Zion, Zion, Zion. If you do a, a quick search, you'll see that the prophet Isaiah uses that term like 50 times over and over and over. It means Jerusalem, but it means so much more. You see how that works? It's just all packed in there. And so when they decide that they have to remember, we have to remember, uh, it does mention Jerusalem, but a few times it says, remember Zion. It's not just the city, it's not just the temple, it's not just the king, it's God's promise. As it's been manifest for us for forever that we can remember, this has been the reality. Do not forget God's promise. That's a tough ask for people who are hundreds of miles away and their hometown, they're, they're getting word via news and messengers that the city has fallen and the temple has fallen. Do not forget Zion. We have to remember that promise. And then there's all the nasty feelings toward the Edomites. Oh, those Edomites uh, and Babylon. So um, we're just running out of time here. I wonder, are there any questions or comments about anything we've talked about? So what I would like to do in the future, 
and feel, feel free to chime in any time. But what I'd like to do as we continue forward, uh, I think my favorite thing to do in Bible study is to let scripture interpret scripture. So what I'm hoping to be able to do is read uh, maybe like a part of Second Kings, see what the history book has to tell us. Uh, if you haven't been in confirmation with me, remember the Bible is like a library. It's filled with books, 66 books, and they're all different genres. They're all written in very different ways. Um, and so sometimes it can be effective to say like, let's see what the history section has to tell us about this. Let's read a non, I don't want to call it nonfiction, none of it's fiction, but let's see what the history book has to say. Then let's hear how the prophets are interpreting that and communicating to people about God's continuing power and promise. Uh, and so we may jump around a little bit, but I think by the end of 10 weeks, you'll know a lot more about the exile, definitely know more about Jeremiah, definitely about Ezekiel and some other things, maybe some of the heroic tales of Daniel and that kind of thing. But um, please plan to make this part of your weekly routine. I'm planning on making it a part of my weekly routine. So you could do that, right? And we're gonna end at seven so that folks who are coming over for choir have time to do so. Anything else? Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you for this time to be together. We thank you for all that your people and our ancestors, our ancestors in faith have seen. And we thank you for all that they wrote down, the way that they told their stories, the way that they talked to each other about your power and how that's available to us now in your scripture. We thank you, oh God, for leading us through wilderness and exile too, and for your never failing promise that you are present, you are powerful, and you have good things planned. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.